Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Saturday the 27th of June 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We jump into the white hot burning fire of Marx's critique of the social democrats that is chapter 3 the defeat of the petty bourgeois democracy. This week I have the new patrons Vess Vs, Kenneth Wilford, Max Faga and Michael Moreno Resendez to thank. If you like today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month you get two patron only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Your support really does make this show possible. Okay, let's jump into the discussion. Hello and welcome to the fourth live stream of the 18th premiere of Joe Biden. Here we have today a very full house. We've got all the way from Canada. We got our, our got Kyle. How's it going, Kyle? Pretty good, pretty good. Favorite chapter. Let's go. Let's do it. All the way from not too far from me in London, we got James ret- returning, recovering, looking slightly like a cancer victim, but it really <laughs> is a coronavirus victim. Yeah, recover from the Rhina, ready for some Brumaire, dense chapter three. Let's go. Then next along is the Narcom of Arna Nation, looking suave, thin, look like he's eating organic vegetables, <laughs> not not doing anything bad, no, giving up the crack, the mess. The whole lot. Derek, how's it going? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty much meth free here in Utah, which is kind of rare. And um, <laughs> I haven't, I, I have not caught Rona yet, although I may have actually in February. So that's another story. You're now going to know why I called Jacobin Magazine Gerontian an Orleanist for so long. <laughs> Orleanist, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> but let, let, let's, let's go. I'm going to call him legitimist. Uh, next, we have. Esri, all the way from which planet are you from, Esri? I don't know, New York metro area. That's all. That's all people need to know. There that's, you go. That's, that's the most credible way of saying it. You'd know a New Yorker would call New York a planet. Okay. Next up is mm. uh, is Sophie, all the way down south, deep in the where in the mangroves of Arizona. In the what? <laughs> there, there are no <laughs> groves in Arizona. There's You're thinking no- of the spicy Southwest. I know, I've never been sarcastic. It's a desert. I fucking know I've been there. I just oh, thought, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put my ye up your ha if you don't shut up. Well, I don't even know what that means. Let's keep going. Okay. Now, today we have with us the third chapter. They call it the defeat of the petty bourgeois democracy. Last week we had the downfall of the pure republicans. This week we've got the defeat of the petty bourgeois democracy. Okay, this chapter is honest to God. It's a goddamn beast. Um, we're going to nearly have to read every single paragraph of this because it's that damn good. Now, I'm going to give over the first reading part of it to Kyle because he's got a very bombastic good voice and it's a good way to start us all off. On May 28, 1849, the Legislative National Assembly met. On December 2nd, 1851, it was dispersed. This period covers the span of life of the constitutional or parliamentary republic. In the first French Revolution, the rule of the constitutionalist is followed by the rule of the Girondist and the rule of the Girondist by the rule of the Jacobin. Each of these parties relies on the more progressive party for support. As soon as it has brought the revolution far enough to be unable to follow it further, still less to go ahead of it, it is thrust aside by the bolder ally that stands behind it and sent to the guillotine. The revolution thus moves along an ascending line. It is the reverse with the revolution of 1848. The proletarian party appears as an appendage of the petty bourgeois democratic party. It is betrayed and dropped by the latter on April 16. May 15, and in the June days. The Democratic Party, in its turn, leans on the shoulders of the Bourgeois Republican Party. The Bourgeois Republicans no sooner believe themselves well-established than they shake off the troublesome comrade and support themselves on the shoulders of the party of order. 
The party of order hunches its shoulders, lets the bourgeois republicans tumble, and throws itself on the shoulders of armed force. It fancies it is still sitting on those shoulders when one fine morning it perceives that the shoulders have transformed themselves into bayonets. Each party kicks from behind at the one driving forward and leans over in front towards the party which presses backward. No wonder that in this ridiculous posture it loses its balance and, having made the inevitable grimaces, collapses with curious gyrations. The revolution thus moves into descending line. It finds itself in this state of retrogressive motion before the last February barricade has been cleared away and the first revolutionary authority constituted. The period that we have before us comprises the most motley mixture of crying contradictions. Constitutionalists who conspire openly against the Constitution, revolutionists who are confessedly constitutional, a National Assembly that wants to be omnipotent and always remains parliamentary, a Montaigne that finds its vocation in patience and counters its present defeats by prophesying future victories, royalists who form the Patres Conscripti, or elders of the Republic, are forced by the situation to keep the hostile royal houses they adhere to abroad, and the Republic, which they hate, in France. An executive power that finds its strength in its very weakness and its respectability in the contempt that it calls forth. A Republic that is nothing but the combined infamy of two monarchies, the Restoration and the July Monarchy, with an imperial label. Alliances whose first provisio is separation, struggles whose first law is indecision, wild, inane agitation in the name of tranquility, most solemn preaching of tranquility in the name of revolution, passions without truth, truths without passions, heroes without heroic deeds, history without events, development whose sole driving force seems to be the calendar, wearying with constant repetition of the same tensions and relaxations, antagonisms that periodically seem to work themselves up to a climax only to lose their sharpness and fall away without being able to resolve themselves, pretentiously paraded exertions and Philistine terror at the danger of the world's coming to an end, and at the same time the pettiest intrigues and court comedies played by the world redeemers, who in their laissez-aller remind us less of the day of judgment than of the times of the Fronde. The official collective genius of France brought to naught by the artful stupidity of a single individual. The collective will of the nation, as often as it speaks through universal suffrage, seeking its appropriate expression through the inveterate enemies of the interests of the masses, until at length it finds in the self-will of a filibuster. If any section of history has been painted gray on gray, it is this. Men and events appear as reverse schlemmels as shadows that have lost their bodies. The revolution itself paralyzes its own bearers and endows only its adversaries with passionate forcefulness. When the red specter continually conjured up and exercised by the counter-revolutionaries finally appears, it appears not with the Phrygian cap of anarchy on its head, but in the uniform of order, in red breeches. Okay. In that paragraph has to be one of the longest sentences in, in, in the English language. You realize that it goes for like, I think it's like about a 200 words. That is a yeah. hell of a sentence. It's a chonker. It's got about 400 clauses in there, yet it reads well. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Almost you... like what they teach you in writing class is an absolute law. <laughs> in German, I've read a lot. Like in German, I read like four page sentences sometimes. It's pretty crazy. They have this. Yeah, but those sentences are like one word. An incredible concept here I like is in this one of the early paragraphs where he basically talks about how the dynamic in this revolution is backwards from the 1793 revolution. What, why do we think that this like so in the 1793 revolution, he talks about how it's like, you know, the, the most radical group was constantly pushing forward, pushing forward. And here it seems to be the most radical groups the, as uh, they seem to be leaning more on the most conservative elements all the way once the proletarians got their heads kicked in so why do we think this is the case i i think it has to do with what we were talking about in the first chapter first is tragedy then as far as and i think he's kind of making that broader dare i say dialectical point but maybe i'm missing something what are the reasons behind the dynamic more than just saying oh history's repeating itself you know what like what are the financial forces there is a financial panic in france in 1847 
that that's part of it. That's part of what led to the Blancas workhouses. There's a famine as well, Derek, isn't there? There's yeah, the famine, there's a famine like Irish too. famine and, and these yeah. other potato famines. Well, I, well, I kind of, I don't know what the explanatory like balance of class forces is behind it. I can only echo what Sophie's saying where like, this is the dynamic of a farce of a revolution. A revolution has a certain structure. Actually, I think Mike Duncan might have crypto quoted Marx when he was talking about his approach to looking at like, you know, where a revolution ends. And he's talking about like, you know, the more radical faction dispensing with other things. But this, this is a dynamic of a farce. This is like when you immediately lose your social mandate and it's just dwindling from there. It's like, you know, Occupy Wall Street or something. I, I think Marx places it with the defeat of the proletarian faction at the outset. And the proletarian faction being unable to achieve any leadership in this dynamic. And therefore, like that red specter being there, but a progressively more and more reactionary result being attained. Right. What, didn't in the French Revolution, the saint culotte like... But didn't the Jacobin kind of they, they would use them manipulatively and cynically, but like they were around, and they weren't even really like a like a properly like organized proletarian faction as much as what you had in 1848. But the key difference is that the revolutionaries just immediately turned on that faction, whereas in the French Revolution they kind of they let that faction exist and use them cynically. But that faction was there, and I'm specifically referring to the Jacobins using these on culotte cynically. Well, I mean, they start turning on them when, like, um, the Sun Kilat become more and more sympathetic to, like, the Inrajes. So towards the end of the terror, there's more hostility. And also the, all the expansionist wars start dwindling a lot of what would have been <laughs> the people in the Sun Kilat. When when we look at this, so I, I think there's a couple of things you got to like keep it. There's a famine going on because of bourgeois monocropping, right? Really, it's what's causing it. Right? It's, it's related to the potato famine. Once the proletarian faction is defeated, where are the peasants going to go? Because they're starving. The executive power, right? Exactly. But they were never they were never really with they were always with the executive power were they not were they not well, all were the, were the peasants not really the, the a lot of the votes for Napoleon and the and yeah, the they, uh, they party of order it was the peasants and like a faction of the petty bourgeois it seems but the party of order gets more and more like more and more into it because where are the peasants like where are the peasants going to go period end of discussion you know and that's a very different role then peasants played in the revolution, in the first French Revolution, even though you have the Vendée, which were the peasants are reactionary faction, former peasants make up most of the sans culotte. We don't really have a proletariat yet. You have a ex-urban urban peasant declassed by urbanism population, and you have the, the peasants in the Vendée who are still highly attached to the church, which is also a lot of their social and welfare function. And so they have a tendency to be to be reactionary and the first French Revolution for religious reasons, it doesn't seem like it's religious readings motivating them into the party of order now. Is there a case to be made that in the first French Revolution, the revolutionary class, the, the bourgeois, was pretty much fully formed? Whereas in this revolution here, the revolutionary class, which seems to have been primarily proletarian, the proletariat still by this stage were only really formed in, in the city of Paris and maybe some other places that they still were not fully formed. So it wasn't an equivalent comparison. Right. I think that's true. And I think the other issue, I mean, when I talked about the revolutions of 1848 in general, that's what I, one of the things that came up over and over again is, is the proletariat wasn't fully formed and it was still highly tied into it. In other places in the nationalist movements, not in the same way in France. But when you look at, in the specific context of France, it seems like you have a half-formed proletariat, but the proletariat's really not running the economy. And it's different from England because while England didn't have a lot of land reforms or whatever, England's enclosure movements meant that peasants weren't peasants. They were like, you know, either yeomen or they were agrarian workers. They were literally laborers. They were an agricultural proletariat. And that's not what you have in France. I think another thing is that the bourgeoisie initially takes a 
revolutionary act here, right? The the especially the petty bourgeoisie, they are overthrowing the Orleanists. But unlike in the Ancien Regime, the composition of the ruling class and the form of government they have is very contradictory, right? So the, the, the bourgeoisie comes to power, they form the republic, but then their social interests are immediately opposed to the proletariat and their composition is mixed up with the royalist factions. The royalist factions, as Marx will say in this chapter, they find the republic to be suitable for their class rule, but they can't really stay satisfied with the republic for both their sectional interests and also because it's kind of embarrassing to be royalist republicans. And so like this is I think what I'm getting at is that the dominant faction that would be overthrown is itself kind of like it's it's devouring itself and not really reactionary in exactly the same way that the ancien regime was. But well, yet it devours itself. And it's not like the process that the reactionary de maestra is, is, is zooming in on where you have the, like weatherman effect writ large, you know? We need to get purer and purer. The direction is getting more and more like obviously like betraying their principles or whatever. The monarchical Republicans get it the worst of this. Like, I mean, Marx has, you know, pretty scathing things to say about all parties involved, but he has the least respect for them. And, you know, this is a revolution that Marx was like looking forward to. This is the revolution that the Communist Manifesto is most immediately pointing towards. You know, like Marx had high hopes for this. When you read his notes on the international, he's always talking about how the working class had actually become more regressive since 1848, which is very interesting when you read this, right? He was always getting frustrated with the kinds of deals they had to make in the first international and with, and with the groups are trying to deal with the groups that would make up the SP day in Germany. And he would always compare it to 1848, which I, I, again, yeah. you know, I found fascinating because he's always getting crap from the anarchist faction for not fighting in this in any country. Okay, well, the, the next bit, he's just going to talk a little bit about what the makeup of the new Legislative National Assembly was. So this was the kind of parliament that was voted in in December 1848, at the same time when Bonaparte got made president. Now, there were 750 seats. About 500 of them went to the Party of Order, okay? And that was split between the three basically main factions, the Orleanists, so that was the basically the those that supported the Orleanist fa uh, family's claim to the throne, which was backed by the kind of financial capital, new industrial bourgeoisie, and you had the legitimists. The legitimists were the basically the old original kings uh, line who were basically representing the landed gentry, and also in the party of order. Then you had a small faction, so only a small faction, I think, with about fifty seats was the Bonapartists. So the Bonapartists, but they were not not large enough to even form their own independent party. So you had the Party of Order, which was the big block of around 500 seats. You had 50 pure Republicans who we talked about getting shafted last week. And then we had about 200 of the uh, Montagne. Okay, so this is the mountain that was the so-called, this is the Social Democrats or what do we call them? Petty bourgeois democracy so this is the party of the Social Democrats. And we're going to find out here more about what happens to this all great mix up. So that's the kind of balance of forces. 500 in the party of order split between the legitimists, the Orleanists and the Bonapartists. And then we've got 200 in the Montagne, the mountain, which is the Social Democrats. I was so surprised to see that. I was surprised to see Social Democrat being like a faction here by name led by their leader, Bernie Sanders, who, who I think is going to get knifed and is going to be taken over by the 18th Premier, Joe Biden. I think that's what the book's about. I don't want to ruin the plot for people, but that's where it's <laughs> going, alert. okay? Spoilers. Spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> and finally, a, a rump of 50 pure Republicans. There is one thing that I forgot to mention that, again, for those of you keeping score, 
of what Marx might think of Scott Stalinism, when the red specter continually conjured up and exercised by the counter-revolutionary finally appears, it appears not with the Phrygian cap of anarchy on its head, but in the uniform of order in red breeches. That's, that's Marx being like, yeah, remember when, when uh, socialist iconography was revolutionary? That's, this is the difference. You know, maybe that explains the weird tendency of, of anarcho-tanky alliances. I mean, like, cause that's something I've never understood, but see all the time. This is, so, I don't want to digress too much, but I think that has some more to do with like national liberation and, and Maoism than it has to do with, with whatever this is. But okay. I mean, the, the thing is when I, when I was talking, when, when you talk about national liberation, the, the Marxist weirdness on national liberation actually completely comes up from this period because they could not no. figure out how to deal with the European nationalist movements. And it was a constant thorn in his side in the first international, even though he was aligned in the first international with Garibaldi. And so, like, all that comes up. How, how, how the anarchists and Marxists even start, like, you know, Mike Duncan covers this pretty well, but um, how the anarchists and Marxists even start, like, talking has to do with their mutual support of national unification and national liberations in the failing medieval empires. And so those stances come in from that period. And that plays into the way Marx views the U.S. Civil War. That play, it, it plays into a lot of things, but it creates problems later. And so I think that's kind of, I think it goes all the way back to here. Marx is like recognizing this. That's, that's fair. Part. Yeah, no, I mean, a- anarchists were in some ways even more, in this period were even more pro-Nat Lib than the Marxists were. In this case, though, in that sentence, Marx has sympathy for the Phrygian cap of anarchy and that red tradition and seemingly disdain for the red britches, the uniform of order. Like that this is one of its farcical elements, the way that it abuses history. We've seen that the ministry which Bonaparte installed on December 20th, 1848 on his Ascension Day was a ministry of the party of order of the Legitimist and Orleanist coalition. This Borough ministry had outlived the Republican Constituent Assembly, whose terms of life it had more or less violently cut short and found itself still at the helm. Jean Garnier, the general of the Allied Royalists, continued to unite in his person the general command of the 1st Army Division and of the National Guard of Paris. Finally, the general elections had secured the party of order a large majority in the National Assembly. Here, deputies and peers of Louis Philippe encountered a hollow host of legitimists for whom many of the nation's ballots had become transformed into admission cards to the political stage. The Bonapartist representatives of the people were too sparse to be able to form an independent parliamentary party. They appeared merely as the evil appendage of the party of order. Thus, the party of order was in possession of the governmental power, the army, and the legislative body in short, of the whole of the state power. Legislative body, state power, Marx said so. It had been morally strengthened by the general elections, which had made its rule appear as the will of the people, and by the simultaneous triumph of the counter-revolution on the whole continent of Europe. Never did a party open its campaign with greater resources or under more favorable auspices. So he's really setting the stage here for like, you know, the dominant position of the party of order, yet within, what, two years, the parliament was gone. Does this remind you of something? It reminds me of something. It reminds me of, I don't know, maybe when the Democrats controlled all branches yeah. of government in 2008 and couldn't do anything with it and were deposed within two years except for the executive. Yeah, <laughs> I did. That is like what that last bit reminds me of deeply. Although the Democrats, you know, that's a proud Democratic Party tradition. You know, they're good at that. But um, it's, it's, Bojure, it's farce becomes history. Good PR only lasts two years. That's the rule. <laughs> yeah. So there's an intervention into future Marxian state debates between people like Kautsky. And this even has some pressure on the later Angles. Angles always recognize that. The parliament was part of the state power, duh, fucking obviously. But there is a notion that the state is really just a special body of armed men. So something like a parliamentary body, is that really the state? 
Yes. Yes, it is. Smart stuff. That was a way to try to sneak the LaSallean position back in without saying you were doing it. Partly because LaSalle actually saw the parliament as an annoyance. And that's why he was always writing Bismarck letters. And so there's some real thing there. But it, it's interesting because none of that's happened yet. Yet you can totally see Marx like glomming on to where this is going to go in Germany by what's happening in France. <laughs> you know, Germany's not even a thing yet, but you still see it. Germany is not even a thing. Okay. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, there's there's a line in here I wanted to discuss because I, I love it, but I'm not entirely clear on it. It's just after he talks about the party of order getting into a majority in the National Assembly, where he says, here the deputies and the peers of Louis Philippe encountered a hallowed host of legitimists for whom many of the nation's ballots have become transformed into admission cards to the political stage. So is he saying there that essentially the way the votes went in the uh, the election, the legitimists were given a degree of political power and representation via representative democracy that they had not possessed up until that point yeah i mean that's the irony is like vote for me and never have to vote again but that's yeah. what <laughs> that's what's yeah. there and, and the bonapartists have spread too sparsely to be able to even form an independent parliamentary party and they're existing as this evil appendage which kind of it, it's almost like the way the brexit party never really had kind of formal representation in power but exerted this kind of influence on the tory party as this kind of evil appendage that didn't quite have kind of formal representation. It's so difficult for me to read so much of this without kind of overlaying what's going on in the UK. Or you know? the Trumpist faction of the Republicans versus yeah. the Republicans <laughs> overall. I mean, it just you yeah. see this over and over. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The tail's no. wagging the dog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Big time. Big time. It's like, uh, well, I suppose it just works as a kind of like a, what do they call them? What do they call them in, uh, in in truck groups? Is it a faction? Is it just faction? Is there another word? There's a tendency, and trots don't ban tendencies. Trots often are tendencies. They're, no, they're that's what they do. I tell you what, I wasn't thinking of <laughs> a ginger group. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, fact. You mean fact? So you know what's interesting? It does seem like that how this works. Going back over that chapter is like the right formed a united front. Correct. Like, yeah. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah then. It it dealt with its prime enemy, and then it dealt with its other enemy, and then it dealt with itself. <laughs> <laughs> Self negates. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the same way that you know the reactionaries cheer on revolutions because it slaughters all the revolutionaries. This does appear as a sort of like I don't know Benny Hill theme, like political meltdown. Of course, it ends in you know. Ends in the reign of Louis Bonaparte, but he doesn't really come out smelling like roses, more like grape shot. It, it, it's so eerie reading this after having like a year ago rereading Demestra and like yes. Demestra saying, all oh, this was going to happen. <laughs> it was just like, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's the weirdest thing about Demestra is that he's like, <laughs> he's a restorationist, right? He's a bourbon restorationist. Right. Um, but it's just like, yeah, all this is going to fall apart. and It's going to do this and this, 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 and this is going to happen. Cause like, you know, these revolutionaries are going to kill each other and there's not going to be anything. Le- I was just like, Ooh, Ooh. Anyway, Derek, do you want to take this? Yeah. The shipwreck pure Republicans found that they had melted down to a clique of about 50 men in the legislative national assembly the African generals, Kamignac, Lacmore, and Bedou. The great opposition. Well, what is it about? Of- what is it about Americans that think like particularly French words are like laughable, and you should sneer at them? Like there's something. It's kind of weird. It's like an English freedom people price, think. freedom <laughs> price, freedom <laughs> price. They don't love their America. freedom over there. Uh, you English. know what? Actually, it is for me. I actually don't. I don't find French words laughable. I just find it really confusing how their Frankish pronunciation patterns really altered Latin. Because it's not hard for me to say other Latin languages in the way same. it's hard for me to say French. <laughs> like, okay, that accounts for yeah, my same. why I'm bad at it, but why I giggle about it and and don't learn that much is because. In American leftist culture, your familiarity with French and liberal culture, too, is a sort of like middle class, you know, show of how civilized and worldly you are. Yeah. And that's really where my resentment comes from. It's not against any, 
you know, actual French people or French listeners. Do we have a lot of French listeners? I imagine they don't stick. No, around. like French radical theory <laughs> is actually a class demarcator for a certain kind of yeah. bureaucrat. To be fair, no, it so, totally yeah, is. Uh, I, and it has been for a long time, even even before like radical theory. Like so, oh, I've read Montesquieu. All I'm saying is I'm, I'm glad there's no Irish theory because you fuckers wouldn't have a chance. And the the other thing is like, it's weird because like English people do the same thing to I Irish names and Welsh names, don't they, James? They yeah, just make... it's, it's the strange juxtaposition of consonants, I think, that is inherently uh, amusing on when you, when you cross the border and see the road signs and you're like, what? Yeah, yeah, at least yeah. this is this is empire mocking empire, okay? All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, All yeah, right. That's, the, that's the other thing about when we really talk about it, like I've always said that Americans and French people hate each other because we're actually rudely alike. We're both of the <laughs> enlightenment tradition and we're both very pissy about it. And our nations really come from that from those notions and we really owe each other our existence to each other, but we can't yeah. admit it. So everything's like bad faith denial. They're like the brothers we don't want to admit we have. Yeah. yeah, narcissism of minor differences. Yeah. All right, I'll stop calling it freedom kissing. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. <laughs> All right. The great opposition party, however, was formed by the Montan. The Social Democratic Party had given itself this parliamentary baptismal name. It commanded more than 200 of the 750 votes of the National Assembly, it was consequently at least as powerful as, as any one of the three factions of the Party of Order taken by itself. Its numerical inferiority compared with the entire royalist coalition seemed to be compensated by special circumstances. Not only did the elections in the departments show, but it had gained considerable following among the rural populations. It counted in its ranks almost all deputies from Paris the army had made the confession of a democratic faith by the election of three non-commissioned officers and the leader of the Montan, Le Drou Roland, in contradistinction to all representatives of the party of order, had been raised to the parliamentary peerage by five departments, which had pulled their votes for him. In view of the inevitable clashes with the royalists among themselves and of the whole party of order with, the, with Bonaparte, the Montan thus seemed to have all elements of success before it on May... 28th, 1849, a fortnight later, it had lost everything, honor included. Oh my God, Bernie Sanders and Corbyn once again. Uh, less so Corbyn, yeah. I feel. Because like Corbyn didn't fold, he just got defeated. But Bernie's just kind of folded and then just fucking handed Bernie over the family. Defeated, though. He got defeated, but he, hand, he, he then handed them the family silver. He could have done anything. I mean, he could have he could have ran differently and said, "Fuck it, I'm going to I'm going to burn the party down." He could have done all those things. And what did he do? Right. He just handed him the silver. Where Corbyn couldn't say, "I'm going to grow as an independent party," because it would never have happened. It just it, the, the same thing. What what what's never going sad to about this is that when I say this position you get in, though, this happens all the time. Where you're in a minority position, you're structured the room, you have a strong leadership, and there's going to be internal factions that you can't navigate that pull you apart. And that happens, I mean, that happened in 1914. That happened, frankly, it happened in Russia. It's just one side had a military superiority of the other. I mean, like, you just see this over and over and over again. And I, and I think it's, it's interesting in terms of how the way that Sanders, you know, I don't know if you can say he got screwed or whatever by the democratic establishment, but with what we've seen published in that Labour Leaks report, the amount of factional, you know, the, the worst fever dreams of kind of a, momentum member about what was going on in terms of the actual bureaucratic structure of the Labour Party has been completely confirmed by that document that was leaked. And so although Tom's right, I think Corbyn you know, did get defeated at the ballot box, there was even within the Corbyn context, this kind of structural factional opposition going on within the party that certainly in the 2017 election potentially affected the outcome. If getting elected is your strategy... You can't say being outmaneuvered is being screwed because that's what happened. I mean, yeah, yeah it was yeah, a yeah. really naked political class kind of like, oh, no, we can't allow this to happen to our party. It's politics. But, they got yeah. politically defeated. Yeah, they're politically defeated. This is, you know, part of why people are skeptical of that kind of, of strategy of winning like a socialist of any stripe winning in the Democratic Party. Particularly from the executive, though, because like. Unlike this is where right, the, yes. this is another thing where the, the the difference between Corbyn and Bernie is actually pretty illustrative. Corbyn had to have a pretty strong faction to ever like within his own party to ever get in the situation he was in. 
He had no um, faction, Der- Derek. The faction was like seven people. Oh, it was literally, well, they, they just felt sorry for him that they should put up at least one leftist. And then, holy shit, everybody started voting for him. There was okay. nobody in the left of the Labour Party. James, tell me, uh, James, am I right about that? How many was there? I, ten, at, ten at the most. I think that you could, um, if you take the 2016 chicken coup in terms of the MPs that voted against him or voted to move to another leadership election, there were about 40 that... So you could loosely say there were 40 that were loosely supported, but to be properly loyal to him, probably just under 10, I'd say. Of a parliamentary party of, at the time, would have been... 250 250. So his faction was like, like literally probably about yeah. 10. So and with the entire had... internal bureaucracy kind of like nakedly against him is kind of extraordinary. So, so actually not that different from Sanders, except slightly less of a folder. I'd, I'd say probably about the same. Both of them. Like, how many people, how many Democrats in the House of Congress, uh, the House of Representatives actually defended, so, were Sanders loyalists? I, I, a- AOC was, like, even mm. he- hesitant herself to, like, <laughs> really back him. Four, Seriously. And, 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 and in the moments in the moments of crisis, two. Yeah. So right. there, it shows you, like, like uh, tell me, I only found out, like, about two weeks ago that AOC interned for was it ted, ted kennedy. kennedy i don't so, i have never trusted <laughs> seriously so there. no she's a fucking she's uh once i heard that she's definitely going to betray everybody for power she's, in, <laughs> she's the definitely betrayal is too strong a word she was she had a good she had good marketing she got the right to like you know thirst hate on her on you know twitter or her your twitter staff you know got like really amped up this like campaign that like you know, basically did to the right what the alt-right usually does to the left, right? Like, evoke a certain kind of, like, oh, I'm so furious, I'm furious at you, kind of response. I'd say, I guarantee yeah, so, you, she will go the way of Obama within 10 years. She will be in, well, you will not be able to tell the difference between her and a normal Democrat. Except so, for the, the word Europe, socialism. It's, yeah, no, she's already li- literally that. a word. She's she, she's not she has never repaid the DSA any of its later you know flipping for her doesn't mention it never helped it so I I mean I bring that up because like one of the things about about AOC that we're gonna have to contend with is to be fair if she doesn't do that she's totally screwed because she's being redistricted and that was already gonna happen. So if she doesn't start, if she didn't capitulate some to the center of the Democratic Party, there was going to be no way they were going to support her to keep her house seat when they, when her, her current constituent base was going about to be completely diluted by redistricting in New York. That was going to happen even from moment one. So like, it's just, it's like a game theoretic problem that you're going to see that. And one of the things that I, you know, Whoa, be it on to me to bring in bourgeois game theory when we're talking about the Brumaire. But one of the things I'm starting to think is like, dude, these choices are bounded and they show up over and over and over again. And it's like it's like math almost. It's kind yeah. of when you set the rules of the game, it's fucking math. I think we none of us here is like pointing to like a moral, you know, like a moral failing of AOC as to why this is happening. Like, like a fucking course, you would have to capitulate to stay keep her seat. Like, I think. No one's She's surprised always, by that. No, I, I would go further. I would say that somebody who interns for Ted Kennedy and then just turns up on the radical left of the DSA and trendy when Bernie Sanders is trending and gets and and is really media trained and all that and comes through and then starts moving to the right. Look, I think she was going to the right anytime. I can't imagine a socialist going to say, do you know who I'd want to go in and uh, intern with? I don't want to learn about Marx or anything. I, I want to go to Ted fucking Kennedy. Give us okay. a break. Like, Come on now. Yeah, but I, I think like if somebody interned for Ted Kennedy and then, I don't know, did, when I was growing up, there was like a special on Fox where a magician was telling all the secrets of the trade. You know what I mean? Like if someone came from that background and had that attitude towards it and was like scathing and uh, about, you know, the Democrats and like, didn't like echo their talking points and was, you know, trying to treat Sanders as, you know, really like the new figurehead of a tendency or something and trying to echo that and cultivate other candidates and, and work with the DSA, honestly, like, like the way Sanders, the Sanders campaign and, and the DSA cooperated, like, I, I don't know to what extent that actually is. I'm, 
sure it was kind of like a one-way street, but I think there was formal cooperation. DSA is out there. Please correct me if I'm lying. Bernie Sanders was a formerly a member of the DSA at one point, though, in which you cannot sit, you know, and I guess AOC may have been at 1.2. I don't know. I actually haven't checked that. But um, one of the things that I just want to, like, like bring up, I, I am actually, yeah, I don't think it's just moral here. I mean, whatever you think about that, that, that might be there too, but that there's just, it's a bound game. One of the most insightful things I learned about AOC that again, reminds me of this um, is when AOC didn't, didn't back anyone to dethrone Pelosi because most of the contenders with power mm. were, yes. at, were more right wing than Pelosi was. So there was literally no option except for the, the four freshman senators that come from very specific districts. Yeah, I remember sassing her for this. And then I think it was even you, Derek, who said like, well, every, she said everyone you know, else who was, you could choose besides Pelosi was worse. It probably is that, a that, fucking that, political shrew, you know. But, like block but, up your four people and, and, you know, threaten a boycott if you don't get certain thing, things. Like, like when you say brown people... Ezra, you got to be more specific. It's actually not just brown people. It's brown. I didn't say brown people. What you can't tell us apart? <laughs> no, it, it's it's it, 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 it's or whoever said that. It's that it's it's a very specific. Who's the racist? Point. Who's the racist on this show? I don't Who think anyone it? said anything about brown people. Um, somebody did. Really? Yeah. No, but- I think she said round up. I think she said round up. Yeah, yeah oh, round okay. up your four. Round up your four, 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 four freshman senators are all of color, but they're all specifically of. They're not. Um, I mean, Congress people. Because Congress people we're talking about the house, color. right? Yeah, they're all of color. They're all women, but they're not actually from the from the normal democratic black demographic because most of them are. I think what two two of them are Muslims. So that's actually they're not actually in the machine power of the Democratic Party, including the Black Congressional Caucus. And so there's a whole lot of like they're they're hyper alienated from the rest of the party. And they have their own concerns okay. that are not always with, with Bernie Sanders. And if you don't, like Ilhan Omar complicates things a lot. Yeah, o- um, Omar has more autonomy than AOC. And she's more, re- like, I would I would put my money on she would be a better candidate if the left was to do it in four years' time and go for this Bernie part three. If Someone like Ilhan Omar would be a lot fucking better. She's better on foreign policy. She doesn't she's strike me on as... Foreign policy, as long as you're not talking about Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Yeah. I haven't seen that bit. I haven't seen that bit, though, in fairness. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Needless to yeah. say, this reminds us of now. Okay, this is not the AOC podcast. You're looking for a different one if you hear all 21 people. If I say that, might go down to only 20. There's bound to be one AOC thirst, thirst spot here. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we're punching the Leninists. We're punching the Social Democrats. Who's left? Thanks. Like, comment, subscribe. Thank you for your yeah. time. <laughs> uh, okay. James, how do you feel about reading this paragraph? Yeah, sure. Before we pursue parliamentary history further, some remarks are necessary to avoid common misconceptions regarding the whole character of the epoch that lies before us. Looked at with the eyes of Democrats, the period of the Legislative National Assembly is concerned with what the period of the Constituent Assembly was concerned with. The simple struggle between Republicans and Royalists. The movement itself, however, they sum up in the one shibboleth, reaction. Night in which all cats are grey and which permits them to reel off their night watchman's commonplaces. And to be sure, at first sight, the party of order reveals a maze of different royalist factions, which not only intrigue against each other, each seeking to elevate its own pretender to the throne and exclude the pretender of the opposing faction, but also all unite in common hatred of and common onslaughts on the Republic. In opposition to this royalist conspiracy, the Montagna, for its part, appears as the representative of the Republic. The party of order appears to be perpetually engaged in a reaction, directed against press, association and the like, neither more nor less than in Prussia. And as in Prussia, carried out in the form of brutal police intervention by the bureaucracy, the gendarmerie and the law courts. The Montagna, for its part, is just as continually occupied in the warding off of these attacks and thus defending the eternal rights of man, as every so-called People's Party has done, more or less, for a century and a half. If one looks at the situation and the parties more closely, however, this superficial appearance which veils the class struggle and the peculiar physiognomy of the period disappears. That's a bang of a paragraph, by the way. 
Legitimus and Orleanus, as we have said, formed the two great factions of the party of order. Was what held these factions fast to their pretenders and kept them apart from each other nothing but fleur de lis and tricolore, House of Bourbon and House of Orleans, different shades of royalism? Was it all the confession of faith of royalism? Under the Bourbons, big landed property had governed with its priests and lackeys. Under Orleans, high finance, large scale industry, large scale trade, that is, capital, with its retinue of lawyers, professors, and smooth tongued orators. The legitimate monarchy was merely the political expression of the hereditary rule of the lords of the soil, as the July monarchy was only the political expression of the usurped rule of the bourgeois parvenus. What kept the two factions apart, therefore, was not any so-called principles. It was their material conditions of existence, two different kinds of property. It was the old contrast between town and country, the rivalry between capital and landed property, that at the same time old memories, personal enmities, fears and hopes, prejudices and illusions, sympathies and antipathies, convictions, articles of faith and principles bound them to one or the other royal house. Who denies this? Upon the different forms of property, upon the social conditions of existence, rises an entire superstructure of distinct and peculiarly formed sentiments, illusions, modes of thought, and views of life. The entire class creates and forms them out of its material foundations and out of the corresponding social relations. The single individual who derives them through tradition and upbringing may imagine that they form the real motives and the starting point of his activity, while each faction, or Leonists and Legitimists, sought to make itself and others believe that it was loyalty to the two royal houses which separated them. Facts later proved that it was rather the de their divided interests which forbade the uniting of the two royal houses. And as in private life, one differentiates between what a man thinks and says of himself and what he really is and does. So in historical struggles, one must distinguish still more the phrases and fancies of parties from their real organism and their real interests, their conception of themselves from their reality. Orleanists and Legitimists found themselves side by side in the Republic with equal claims. If each side wished to effect the restoration of its own royal house against the other, that merely signified that each of the two great interests into which the bourgeoisie is split, landed property and capital, sought to restore its own supremacy and the subordination of the other. We speak of two interests of the bourgeoisie, for large landed property, despite its feudal coquetry and pride of race has been rendered thoroughly bourgeois by the development of modern society. Thus, the Tories in England long imagined that they were enthusiastic about monarchy, the church and the beauties of the old English constitution until the day of danger wrung from them the confession that they are enthusiastic only about ground rent. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what, yeah. what, else, what else can you say? <laughs> it's the whole nine Hello. yards. <laughs> Drop the mic. Last time when we were talking about, uh, I think Mark said content and didn't say class content. And I felt like he was going to fill in the blanks in what he meant by content at some point. This is what like a theory of class interests means. This is where some of the epiphenomenal like ideas can be instrumentalized kind of stuff comes in, in historical materialism. Now people really object to the idea that everything, all ideas are determined by economic interests. And I think for good reason, because, you know, people don't really always work that way. But what's most important is what sort of, what determines the limits of your thought, what binds your thought what interests narrow your horizons in a certain way. And Marx will eventually argue against a specific reading of the petty bourgeois in a narrow class interest way. And it's a more sophisticated idea of class interest than what you might expect just doing sociology. Yeah, there's some great, there's some really great stuff in here. I, I like this whole idea about people not being aware of their own actual motives that's an interesting concept what do people think about that i think that's true i mean like absolutely does marx does marx say that they're not that they that they don't know like deep down talks about how like the the royalists are brought up in these traditions of monarchism 
and they see that as being legitimate for themselves, but then that's that's not really what's motivating them in this conflict. Yeah, the single individual who derives them through tradition and upbringing may imagine that they form the real motives and the starting point of his activity. While each faction, Arlenus or Legitimus, sought to make itself and the other believe it was loyalty to the two royal houses which separated them, facts later proved it was rather their divided interests which forbade them from uniting the two royal houses. I mean, so, you know, Marx here is really good at pointing out that, like, we don't always even recognize our material interests, but we act on them anyway. Okay. This is out of step with a sort of distinction that I normally see between Marx and Engels, where Marx usually will talk about epistemic limits, but he's less likely to impute something like false consciousness, where someone is sort of psychologically, like, unaware. But I guess he's not pot. He's not positing that. Like, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. He doesn't point. explain the mechanism at all. He just says, like, look, like, whatever you say you're doing, when you actually look at what your actions do and where your interests are, your interests are your interest in your actions line up more than what you believe as an individual. <laughs> okay, so this is more of a behaviorist description. Right. That, it's not, than like yeah. a theory of mind that Engels gets into. No, okay. yeah. I mean, like one of the things I get mad at all the time, you've heard me say this for like, what, 10 years that, that like Marx is really vague on what his theory of mind is and Engels tries to spell one out, but it's not actually spelled out in Marx at all. And I think it's important in, the, in this context to like remember the sorts of allegations that are slung between the two royalist factions, right? Like with the legitimists, saying that Louis Philippe was plotting to overthrow the Bourbon dynasty his whole, you know, basically his whole life. And that, like, conspiracy theory is something that still sort of sticks around in the historiography to this day. Like, you know, there's a section in Revol- in the Revolutions podcast where Mike Duncan kind of, like, goes into that whole theory and, and, and weighs in on what he thinks Louis Philippe's motivations were because it's such a contentious issue. So for these people who were of either house or or adherents of either house, they were very passionate about these claims of legitimacy. It it wasn't uh, purely instrumental in in their minds, at least. Like it, it always reminds me of like when I meet somebody and I say I'm Irish and they say, oh. Are you from Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland? And I go, oh, I'm from Southern Ireland. And they go, oh, isn't it terrible of what happened up north with the Catholics fighting the Protestants? And I'm always, I'm always, I always say to them, look, none of them know the differences between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Right, it's nothing, right. It's nothing to do with religion. It's got nothing to, do, it's got literally nothing to do with religion, even if that's the form of what it takes. Yeah. But um, there's another there's another bit here as well that I, I particularly like when he talks about, you know, how in the end, when it comes to the crunch, people act upon their material interests that they may have self-denied or not been aware of all along. It kind of always reminds me of like, you know, you're watching some kind of mafia film or something and like there's a mafia boss and his his right hand man is super loyal to him all the way. And then right. at a certain time. He, he he goes too far in like some kind of like a, a war and the guy thinks, oh, well, you know, we I got to change sides. I got to preserve like business. And he goes over to like his his enemy of his entire life. And then he just goes over and then they double cross the guy and away they go. And you find out that the loyalty was nothing. It was literally all about the money. It's all based on the, you know, the, the money in the end of the day. You know, what are the material interests of these people? The other bit of historical context I was interested in is, you know where he references neither more nor less than in Prussia, and as in Prussia carried out in the form of brutal police intervention by the bureaucracy, the gendarmerie and the law court. What is what is the context there? What was going on in Prussia that he needed to kind of give reference to that? That was the guy, who was the guy in, in Russia? Bismarck. And this Bismarck. Is, it is, yeah, it is Bismarck and the Prussian begins, the, the, the Prussian autocracy, which, you know, leads to the Second Reich. And what eats up like the the principate the principate quasi state of Metternich is is Prussian autocracy like squeezing down on that and then expanding out. There's a revealed preferences theory of class interest here, and revealed preferences normally thought of as a you know right wing methodological thing you know through game theory and whatever. But like it's actually pretty useful. You know you watch somebody's feet 
instead of listening to their gums flap. That's all. I always find there's a great opening. Has anybody watched Boardwalk Empire? It opens in, in a scene where the main protagonist, Buscemi, Steve Buscemi is like the local kind of Don who's head gangster in, um, I think it's Atlantic City. And he's like, he's the one who's running all the booze in uh, it's during the, the prohibition. And there he is on the stage. He's waiting to give a speech and he gets up and he's in, it's in front of the temperance society. And he's talking about the evils of booze. You know, <laughs> I always thought that was like a great explanation of what people do cynically in politics. But you got to look at actually not what they say, but actually look at what they actually do in reality. You can explain everything by looking at people's actions and ignoring their words. Just literally don't listen to a word people say and just look at their actions. I was wrong about where we're at. Bismarck Bismarck becomes a politician in 1849. So it's concurrent to this but it's, and Marx would have been writing shortly after it, but um, here's what was actually going on. So what you had was a crackdown. Frederick, uh, Frederick Wilhelm IV promised to merge Prussia with Germany and like, you know, he got assailed by the press or whatever. And then, you know, 1848 breaks out. Then um, Frederick Wilhelm unilaterally imposes a monarchist constitution in December 5th. And the Berlin Assembly is dissolved and it's replaced with a bicameral legislature. And they start pretty heavy crackdown. You know, they cooperate under the old Metternich rules and start suppressing the press and whatnot and mm -hmm. censoring and all that. Um, Bismarck comes Bismarck comes in under that bicameral legislature, but he's not important yet. And I was I was rushing my life. like I tend to do. Was he not? I think he was an advisor before that. Was he? Not I think like... he was. He was an advisor, yeah, but he wasn't like the main main guy until later on. Yeah. So, like, I just wanted to get my because I have this. I I have this tendency to compress everything from 1848 to 1870 in my head. Derek, are you a are you a are you a sufferer from 19th century compression? Yeah, apparently. I, don't, I mean, I can't blame you because like 1848 to 1870 is like the mo some of the most important years were like very little changes from like a revolutionary left perspective. Yeah. A lot of shit yeah. happens. Nothing changes. Yeah. The, the workers movement has uh, a lull in, in Marx's, Marx's sort of speech from the lull. first international. You know, oh. since the crushing of 1848, there's not, there's really like, there's Nothing not much really going on. happens until the That's Labour true. Party start to co coalesce around the United Union movements in 1875. Yeah. So like, I mean, but all the unification of the, of the, all the unification of the nation states happen and like the Habsburgs get there. I mean, a lot happens. A lot on does AOC. happen, but for the left, not a lot happens. On AOC. Yeah. Oh, so AOC is still technically part of the Democratic Socialist, even though she didn't get their endorsement of her chapter originally. Like, I didn't know that because I know she Apparently. didn't actually get that endorsement. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.